hello everyone. Welcome to Dark Chatter number 10. I believe we're into the double digits now. So it's been, this is a, a special anniversary edition then, I suppose. Um, so today we have uh, Avi Friedlander here with us, and he's going to tell us about an interesting new paper I read a couple of weeks ago um, and have promptly forgotten all the details of. So I'm, I'm excited that he's here today to tell us about it. It has to do with black holes in extra dimensions. Um, and if you could just start by giving us an intro to who you are, what kind of research do you like to do, you know, the background of this project. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Avi. Um, I'm in Canada and like grew up here just for uh, locational context. Um, I, so I'm doing my PhD now at, in Kingston at Queen's University. And I guess like how I got involved with this was the first year of my PhD was a lot of just like trying different uh, projects. Um, and a lot of them turning out to not work out. And my supervisor, um, Aaron Vincent, he had been working with a few people on these extra dimensional black holes. And a lot of the projects I'd been looking at were involving um, different effects of dark matter in cosmology and energy transfer and uh, photon signals. Uh, so he thought this would be a good way for me to get involved with um, just a project they've been working on and yeah, uh, something came from it. So yeah. Cool. So give us an, give us an elevator pitch for this paper. Um, yeah. So the title kind of has like all of the key concepts. It's uh, primordial black hole dark matter in the context of extra dimensions. And I can go through and explain what each of those concepts are quickly, yeah, um, if that would be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just going to share some slides. Um, can you see this okay? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, the like, title, um, Primordial Black Hole Dark Matter in the Context of Extra Dimensions, has all of the key concepts um, for the elevator pitch. It's Black Holes, Dark Matter, Extra Dimensions. So. Primordial black holes are just black holes that were created in the early universe. And they can have a big effect on the universe because since the time they were created, they evaporate by a Hawking radiation. And if they survive until today, they could have entirely evaporated. But if they survive until today, they serve as a very interesting cold dark matter candidate. And therefore, they've been studied a lot in the context of four dimensional gravity, but they behave very different in extra dimensional theories. So that's the main premise is that um, in this paper, we are uh, reapplying and redoing a lot of the uh, constraints on black hole evaporation in these extra dimensional theories. Um, and when I talk about large extra dimensions, I'm talking about uh, theories like the ADD model, which was like historically proposed to solve the hierarchy problem and proposes that the true scale of quantum gravity is actually much lower, closer to the electroweak scale. And the way they do that is by introducing n additional dimensions that are compactified to some size. And this uh, radius that they're compactified to is uh, typically like smaller than a millimeter. So they're quite small, large in terms of string theory um, thoughts, which was the historical context they were proposed in, but uh, th they are quite small. And on distances smaller than that, gravity behaves very differently. Uh, the gravitational potential here you see um, will scale not like one over R, but it will drop off much quicker, which means when you get to uh, distances larger than the size of the extra dimensions and the regular four dimensional gravity gets restored, the effective strength of gravity is reduced to uh, the, so that the scale of quantum gravity appears to be at the Planck scale. So that's the historical context that um, kind of set this up. Um, the I was saying that the extra dimensional black holes um, 
behave differently. Um, so uh, because uh, they're governed by gravity, sorry, uh, did you say something? Uh, I, okay. I don't think so. I'm still enjoying oh. it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I thought I heard something. Um, because black holes, uh, they're governed by the laws of gravity, and if gravity changes on those small scales, black holes with horizon radii smaller than the size of the extra dimensions uh, behave quite differently. Notably, they have a larger uh, radius than the four dimensional counterparts, and therefore they have a smaller temperature. So this is a figure that just nicely illustrates that, I think, where the x-axis here is the black hole mass, and the y-axis is the Hawking temperature. Uh, so the different uh, lines here, different numbers of extra dimensions. Uh, and for the black holes with small enough masses or radii so that they uh, see all the extra dimensions, uh, the, all the extra dimensional temperatures are smaller than the four dimensional counterpart, which is this n equals zero uh, line. Um, the other um, way that the extra dimensions play an important role in, in the life of uh, primordial black holes is that it provides a nice production mechanism because uh, particle collisions with uh, energies above the scale of quantum gravity can produce microscopic black holes. And because that scale is much lower, it's a lot easier to get uh, these microscopic black holes. So I, I, I can just talk a bit about the evolution of black holes. Um, this image kind of gives the rough picture. In the early universe, when things are very dense, a bit below that scale of quantum gravity, energetic collisions are happening all the time, and they can form these microscopic black holes. Um, at that point, the universe is dense, so they grow by accretion to some asymptotic mass. And then the universe becomes cooler and more diffuse, so the accretion stops, and the dominant process then is uh, the radiation, the Hawking evaporation. And overall, this uh, can all be put together in one differential equation uh, that shows how the mass evolves over time, uh, where the competition between evaporation and accretion is just controlled by the temperature of the universe and the Hawking temperature, which depends on the mass and the number of extra dimensions. Um, so I said that the first step is the growth of the black holes, the accretion. And here, uh, the x-axis is the temperature that they were produced at. And the y-axis is the asymptotic mass. And it's the asymptotic mass because the mass that they grow to isn't very dependent on the initial mass of the black hole. It's very much dependent on the number of extra dimensions and the temperature it's produced at. And as you can see, there's this dotted line, which is the cutoff where above, at higher temperatures, the universe is hot and dense enough that the black holes will accrete. And below that, that only happens if the black holes start off massive enough. Uh, the one thing I want to point to in this plot is that as the temperature changes by a few orders of magnitude, the mass of the black hole doesn't change much which means that the spectrum of black holes will be a uh, uh, very um, single mass. And the, also that uh, the main determinant of what mass the black holes end up being is the number of extra dimensions. But for a given number of extra dimensions, you can make a pretty narrow prediction of what mass black hole you expect. And I'll get into that a bit more uh, towards the end. So, after uh, the accretor, as I was saying, the main process is they just evaporate. Um, and because they have different temperatures, um, depending on the number of extra dimensions, they have different lifetimes. Um, here, the y-axis shows how long lived the black hole is. And for a given mass, different numbers of extra dimensions have uh, very different uh, lifetimes, or thought about in a different way, um, a black hole evaporating at a given epoch, so a black hole evaporating today, or here, right at the age of the universe, 
would have a, you would expect it to have a very different mass depending on the number of extra dimensions. So I'm talking a lot about evaporation um, and one, uh, it is, I just want to give a little quick uh, detail about what it is evaporating into. So the black holes evaporate into all particles that is, have masses below the Hawking temperature. And for each of those particles, it produces a gray body spectrum, which is just uh, this black body spectrum component uh, distorted by some spin dependent gray body factor that we calculate. Also though, if the black holes are hot enough to be producing unstable particles like muons or hadrons, uh, those particles will cascade and decay. So when we talk about the evaporation spectra of photons and electrons, uh, it's both the gray body component plus the secondary component that results from those uh, cascades. And the main thrust of this paper is looking at the impact this black hole evaporation would have on different uh, cosmological epochs. Uh, so things like Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the CMB, uh, then looking more recently at uh, black holes that would still survive today in the galactic center, and looking at the direct evaporation products from black holes. So the first one that I uh, I'm going to look at uh, starting earliest in the time of the universe is Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So the quick image here that works very well in standard cosmology, which means it's good for setting constraints here, is that when the universe cools to around one MeV, uh, light nuclei start to form. So in standard lambda CDM cosmology, we can make very good predictions for the amount of helium-3, helium-4, and deuterium that would be forming um, in this process, which means if we're adding new physics like extra-dimensional black holes, we can't mess with those predictions too much. And there's a couple ways that black holes do mess with that. Uh, one, black holes and their evaporation products, they can change their expansion rates, uh, which will change the amount of time happening at different points of that nuclei forming. Um, and the important factor here is evapor energetic evaporation products, so like uh, produced photons or hadrons uh, that get evaporated from the black holes can hit into like uh, light nuclei like helium and break it apart. So there you would be reducing the amount of helium and increasing the amount of deuterium you would be following. To really calculate the full effect is requires a very, solving a very complicated nuclear network and there's very specialized codes to do that. And that what we felt was beyond the scope of our project. So we um, didn't do that. Uh, we did however use a recent method that was developed to utilize decaying dark matter constraints uh, because Decaying dark matter is very similar to primordial black holes in a lot of ways. And I can get into the ways that they're similar and different if uh, you want after. But uh, the main point here is that this is a constraint set on decaying dark matter uh, by a group a few years ago. Um, here, the x-axis is the lifetime of the uh, dark matter and the different lines are the different masses. And uh, a method was developed uh, recently in the case of 4D black holes, where you can map these decaying dark matter constraints onto primordial black hole constraints. Um, so notably the lifetime and the mass, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondent of that, of the dark matter properties onto the mass of the primordial black hole. And when you make that mapping, you can then uh, map the strength of the constraints into the fraction of dark matter initially comprised of these black holes. So we did exactly that. And here you can see constraints. Uh, the axes are in terms of initial black hole mass and initial fraction of uh, dark matter comprised of these black holes. And the different colors here correspond to different masses of black holes. And here we can set pretty strong constraints for uh, black holes um, that finish evaporating 
during and soon after uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Moving a bit forward in time, uh, the next uh, epoch that we can set constraints on is the time of recombination. So uh, Planck has very strong observations of the cosmic microwave background. And again, evaporation products from primordial black holes can mess with those observations. So the um, evaporated uh, photons and electrons can scatter the CMB photons, which would distort the observed power spectrum. So there's a code exoclass, which was uh, written that uh, calculates the impact four-dimensional black holes have on the CMB power spectrum. And we modified exoclass uh, to make it work for, for the case of uh, extra-dimensional black holes. We then uh, used uh, MCMC to uh, figure out what parameters are actually allowed. And using that, we were able to set these constraints. Again, the x-axis is initial black hole mass. The y-axis is initial fraction of uh, dark matter comprised of black holes. And these constraints are strongest for black holes that finish their evaporation right after uh, recombination. Um, the one thing uh, to point out here is the dashed lines uh, correspond to, if you ignore the fact that black holes are uh, larger black holes would act like four-dimensional black holes no matter um, uh, how many extra, small extra dimensions you have. Because you can see here in the actual constraints for the n equals 6 and n equals 5 constraints, there's a sharp cutoff, and that's when they start acting like 4D black holes. So if you ignore that transition, you would get these dashed constraints. So moving all the way up to today in terms of black holes, if black holes uh, survive until today are still around, you would expect a lot of them to be in the galactic center uh, where there's a lot of dark matter. And you can uh, observe the direct uh, evaporation products. And there's two main sources. The first one here is direct evaporation to photons, whether they evaporate to your gray body spectrum of photons. And you can integrate over different lines of sight to figure out what spectrum of photons you would expect from each um, angle you would look at. And we compare that to some previously processed integral data. Uh, the other method that uh, you can look for is the evaporation to positrons. And th uh, when the, you evaporate to positrons, they will quickly annihilate to 511 keV photons. So again, you can do that integrating over different lines of sight. But now we compare directly to the 511 keV line that's observed uh, by integral. And using these two methods, we can then set constraints on uh, primordial black holes as they would exist today. So here we have two different plots, uh, the gamma ray continuum, which is uh, from the evaporation to photons, and uh, the, looking at the 511 keV line. And here the masses and fractions of dark matter is those properties today. So after evaporation, what happens, what we would observe in the current state of the universe. Um, and uh, it's important to know that for some of these very low masses, um, like they, they would have a very short lifetime. So they couldn't have been created at this mass. This would correspond to like a pretty fine tuned, um, like small mass, uh, a pretty fine tuned space in initial black hole mass that they would mostly have evaporated today, but would still be just around. But then going to higher masses, um, they likely wouldn't have changed much since the early universe. Uh, the final observable signal is looking for all the black holes that have been evaporating in the time between recombination and today. And because the, the, the universe is uh, homogeneous, we can observe an isotropic X-ray and gamma ray signal. And we compare the uh, predicted signal to the background to make sure that 
of predicted signal doesn't exceed what is observed. And there's two main components. There's an extragalactic evaporation and an isotropic galactic signal. So in terms of extragalactic um, evaporation, there's three main sources. There's direct evaporation, which is that gray body spectrum plus the secondaries I was talking about. You also can evaporate to positrons, which will produce a 511 keV line. And lastly, um, if you're producing energetic electrons and positrons, then you can upscatter CMB photons, producing a, a low energy tail uh, from inverse Compton scattering. After the photons are produced, uh, they will evolve uh, with uh, a few processes. The most important one is redshifting. When the universe expands, the photons become more diffuse and they lose energy. Uh, they can also scatter off um, electrons and deposit some fraction of their energy. Uh, then, then we can get into absorption processes where a photon gets absorbed by neutral hydrogen and kicks off an electron or where it will pair produce an electron positron pair. For the energy range we're looking at, um, all of these scattering and absorption processes aren't important um, at low redshift. So for the um, black holes that survive until the later universe, redshifting is the only important process. However, for black holes that finish their evaporation soon after recombination, scattering and absorption are quite important to include, so we do. Um, so that's the extra galactic signal, but also there is a galactic signal um, because the even though the, the galactic signal, the distribution of dark matter is very anisotropic, there will be some minimum components. So if you integrate along the line of sight away from the galactic center, that's going to be some minimum uh, flux of photons you would uh, be expecting to see in any direction. So that would appear as an additional component to the isotropic signal. So here, this is an example. Uh, the black line is a calculated prediction for the X-ray and gamma ray signal. And we compare it to a large range of X-ray and gamma ray experiments, ensuring that the predicted signal doesn't exceed that of the observed signal. Putting all of these, oh, so doing that, we set these constraints where the peak of the constraints is black holes evaporating today. Um, going further in the past, they have more time to dilute out. And for black holes that uh, survive until today, but survive long into the future, they would be more massive and they have a lower temperature and uh, produce fewer and lower energy photons. So putting all of these constraints together, we can get this plot. So this is for two additional dimensions, and this really has pretty much all of the information from the paper stuck together. So I'm going to just spend a moment explaining everything in here. Uh, so the shaded red region is the regions that I've talked about, where we have set constraints uh, from different cosmological epochs. To the right of this gray dashed line over here, uh, the black hole survived. So higher masses, they would still be around today. And that gives us this top right overabundant region, which would mean that black holes survive until today, and today they would have a larger abundance than uh, the dark matter we see in the universe. That means the very bottom of this overabundant region forms a line where black holes survive until today and would comprise all of dark matter. On the very right edge, there's a grayed out region, which is the next uh, constraint going to higher mass that we didn't recompute. This is uh, from microlensing and doesn't change based on extra dimensions. Lastly, this black line shows the predicted abundance. And as I said at the beginning, the range of masses you expect of the black holes is very narrow, depending on the number of extra dimensions. And here we can see that for two additional dimensions, the primordial, the predicted masses of the black holes are sufficiently heavy so that they would survive until today and be in this region where they could be all of dark matter and not be constrained. So I think that's really quite noteworthy. That this shows that uh, with two additional dimensions, these extra dimensional black holes are an unconstrained, motivated dark matter candidate.
I have a quick question. Some... Oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, so please, yeah, please. I, I thought I remembered you saying that these black holes are hotter in higher dimensions. Is that correct? No, so they're, they're colder. In, okay, they're colder. Okay, that makes sense yeah. then. Because I was just curious about this mass range down here. Because these are very small masses to have survived until today. Yes, exactly. And for, for here you can also see um, that these are a bit small, but these are different numbers of extra dimensions. And you can see that as you go to higher numbers of dimensions, um, the place where the black hole so survival rate shifts to the right. Um, in the case of n equals zero for four dimensional black holes, um, it, the, their lifetime is quite similar to the n equals six case. Um, the reason n equals zero doesn't follow the same pattern is because it ha that you then have like a uh, different scale of quantum gravity. Your scale of quantum gravity is your true Planck scale. But yeah, um, lower mass black holes survive longer in extra dimensions. Um, the other thing you can see here is the big thing that shifts is the predicted mass of the black holes. So for more than two extra dimensions, we predict that the black holes would have fully evaporated before today, but depending on the number of extra dimensions, they might have um, evaporated during a different epoch, meaning that there's different um, detection paths or different ways you can constrain different numbers of extra dimensions. So you've effectively made that kind of asteroid mass range wider than for black holes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, yeah, so, yeah, going back to this plot, the 4D constraints go up to like 10 to the 17 grams. Yeah. And this goes all the way down to 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11. So, yeah, when, if you want to have 10 to the 13 mass uh, gram black holes, um, and you want them to be all dark matter, um, add two dimensions and you can definitely get there. Um, yeah, and like I think that's one of the big conclusions. Um, I'll just say these out of order is that the um, astrophysical observables change a lot um, when you introduce extra dimensions in this light black hole region, which means you can't just look at a traditional 4D primordial black hole constraint plot and say, look, it's all ruled out. Uh, dark matter can't be black holes. Uh, the, the open parameter space changes quite a bit depending on your um, microscopic extra dimensions. Um, the other big conclusion is the fact that extra dimensional theories do generically predict these extra dimensional, uh, these primordial black holes, which one means they predict a dark matter candidate. And also that primordial, if you are someone who cares a lot about the extra dimensions themselves, uh, primordial black holes are a great way to further study them and understand the fundamental theories of gravity. Um, those are just some of the conclusions. Uh, there's a lot more details in the paper that I'm happy to answer questions about now, but I also encourage everyone watching to check out the paper. All right, thanks for that. Those are some very interesting constraints. Um, I've got a few questions and then I'll pass it over yeah. to the, uh, the general audience for more. So my, my questions are slightly more fundamental maybe. The, the first one would be, how much do I care about these large extra dimensions or how much do you care about them rather? Yeah, so th th that's a question that I think, if I'm being honest, I think my opinion has shifted, like fluctuated over time. Um, so the initial motivation, I think uh, my, I have the extra slide right here, it, it was proposed to solve the hierarchy problem, which I think is a, maybe a bit of a controversial question of, is it a problem or not? But I think it's definitely, um, if it's not like a fundamental problem, it's definitely something worth trying to understand if it is a hint at something. And that's just, these scales are so different. And the, uh, people propose things like supersymmetry to try and solve this. Um, but 
Yeah, like I, I think um, extra dimensions is a interesting way to solve it. Um, I know people who study string theory like having extra dimensions, and like I think they're just kind of, kind of a cool idea. Like, who doesn't like extra dimensions? And if they're hinting also at dark matter, then I think they are kind of interesting um, and worth understanding more. Um, hmm. All right, yeah. I've, got a, I've got a technical question and then a broad question. Okay, uh, excellent. I'll, I'll hit you with the technical one first then. So you, you have this thing that shows that the kind of radius of these black holes depends on the number of dimensions. Yeah. So my question is, uh, what, how do you measure or how do you describe the mass of these black holes? So is it kind of dependent on the radius in the same way the, the Schwarzschild radius kind of describes the mass of the black hole? Or is, is there some kind of more complicated way that you, you understand what to call the mass for these different dimensions, you know? Yeah, so I mean, in our equation for the like Schwarzschild radius, there is still a direct uh, relationship between mass and radius of the horizon. Um, so I don't think that really changes um, in the case of the extra dimensions. The only difference is that when you're talking about these scales uh, that are smaller than the extra dimensions, you no longer dealing with a four dimensional theory, you're dealing with a four plus n dimensional theory, which means um, I, I, I definitely have some limitations in my understanding of like some of those black hole relationships. But when you look at things like surface area of the black hole or uh, radius and volume and mass, it, it, all of those relationships, I believe, stay the same except you're now talking about a higher dimensional object. So um, this and is still like, like a Schwarzschild black hole, but with more stuff in it or something like this. Yeah, so th this is still a Schwarzschild black hole, but in a theory with for, like extra, like, so uh, with n equals two, it would be a six dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. Um, yeah, I believe the metric would still be the same, except yeah, space-time indices would be, like you'd have more dimensions there. Hmm. Yeah. All right, that's interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have to keep thinking about that more. I spent a lot of time worrying about mass for black holes, so obviously that's my first question. <laughs> um, yeah, th th that is really the part that like, I do really want to get a stronger grasp on, so. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it's, it's always confusing stuff. So yeah. then my, my kind of follow-up to that is obviously the, I'm sure you know, the primordial black hole of dark matter communities extraordinarily active at the moment. It's kind of having maybe a, a renaissance, you could say. Well, I don't know if it's yeah. the first version. of the, I don't know if you can have another one. Anyway, yeah. what, what kind of response have you gotten to this? Um, so I'd say they're like pretty good. I feel like, I mean, it's only been... Um, on the archive for a couple weeks, I think. Um, but I like I, I and I don't have a huge um, experience with like different levels of um, responses. But like I feel like I've been contacted by more people than on past papers, which I think um, seems like there is interest. And I know I like wrote a thread about it on Twitter and there seemed to be a lot of interest and engagement on that. Um, perhaps even more than I'd expect, which I think like when you can really get into the weeds of a project. So I, I feel like the response has been pretty good. And I think also along with that, like surge in uh, like primordial black hole stuff, there's also been like a bit of starting and looking at extra dimensional black holes as well. Like um, while we were working on this, there was a paper that came out that was kind of doing this, but limited to the um, extra galactic background light -like component of it. So um, there the, the has been looking at both primordial black holes, but also looking at different types of primordial black holes. I know there's been a lot of papers on like current rotating black holes. So 
I think part of that is people trying to think, hey, how can we bend and change these constraints? So I think this really fits in with that community. To... Yeah, I, I remember that Twitter thread. We saw it over in Australia, so it made its way. Oh, wow, well, that's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well done. So I'll, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions for anybody else who has any. I can keep going if no one's got them. <laughs> I got a couple of questions. Hi, yeah. um, hi. Yeah, hi. Roland, Roland Crocker here. Um, I'm just wondering, so when you have um, um, multiple extra dimensions, the, the idea is that, um, you, you know, you, you well, basically the question was, are they all the same size? Um, yes, but I, I think the simple answer is yes. And the um, true answer is, it's easier to say yes. Um, the only place that, like, so when you talk about compactifying them, I am kind of wrapping what I believe is like a whole separate field up into one statement of, oh, they're compactified. Uh, but I know people talk a lot about like, what shape are they compactified into? Are they all the same size? How do they evolve? So the simple assumption here is that they are all symmetrically compactified to the same size. And that those details won't affect our results except for black holes that are very close to that, like with the radii quite close to the size of the extra dimensions. Uh, much smaller black holes will just be small and don't care how big the, uh, how they're, they're compactified. And much bigger ones are, don't really see them either. So there's a, a narrow mass window where those details would be important. And we kind of just left a generic, they are um, compactified to the same size. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Um, so, so I mean, can you give me a sense? I mean, for the, the case you were showing with n equals two, yeah. and um, you, you know, you had the possibility that they could basically explain um, uh, all of the um, uh, the the dense the dark yeah. matter. Um, are, are these black holes? Um, how close are they? Uh, are there? A structured radii to the size of the extra dimensions for the you know the ones that are surviving just below this overabundant um, line here. Um, not extremely close. Um, I don't have the number for two extra dimensions, but I think it goes like a, a few orders of magnitude. To, uh, it, 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 it's definitely not right up against the limit. I, I am now forgetting exactly where that line is. We did make sure that like, it's not um, constrained there. Uh, um, like, yeah, it's definitely not right at that limit, but I don't know quite how close they are. Um, oh, actually, no, we, I do have a plot here that will show that, I think. Um, here, yeah, so uh, in this plot, these vertical dashed lines show that uh, where that crossover is. So for n equals two here, it's at about 10 to the 24. So it's another order of magnitude or two um, up in mass. So you could maybe think of compactifications where it matters, but I do think that's probably enough um, range that you're safe. Thank you. And I, I just had one last question, which was, how is the, um, how does the status of the experimental tests of the, of the pot potential size of a number of extra dimensions, how's that progressed since, you know, 25 years ago when this ADD paper came out? I mean, there's a, the yeah. Earthfish experiments and things. Yeah, so something I kind of like didn't really talk much about for time is all of these constraints, I, I thought I had them in some place. All, all of these constraints, we just hold. So you can talk about the size of the extra dimensions or the scale of quantum gravity because um, they're just related. So we hold the scale of quantum gravity at 10 TeV. Um, the original like ADD paper was proposing 
hey, it's going to be the electro weak scale. So it's going to be one TeV and completely solve the hierarchy problem. Um, and things like the LHC and um, especially in the case of two extra dimensions, um, like small, like microscopic gravity experiments have like narrowed that window. So up to scales of quantum gravity of about 10 TeV, I think there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, that they are constrained, but above 10 uh, TeV, uh, you have the still very much unconstrained. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Very interesting. More questions? Because I can keep going. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I can ask one. So the um, this, this one where you showed the n equals two case, um, and you had this predicted abundance, which was um, could be compatible with all of the dark matter. Um, yeah. Am I right in thinking um, there's probably no way that you could distinguish between like in like a n equals zero and n equals two black hole if it was at that mass because the black holes look the same as each other in 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 all of the extra eventual theories. So this is still they are still small enough that the radius would be smaller than the extra dimensions. Um, so in that sense, they would be distinguishable. Uh, they would have different properties. That being said, like if you look, this is many orders of magnitude above where these evaporation constraints would be. So I. Like maybe if there was some way that you could measure the evaporation constraints, they would be different. Um, but like so, if fundamentally they're different. Distinguishing them and observing them would be quite difficult cosmologically. I would predict, but because they're different, you could then uh, get simultaneous experiments in like uh, particle colliders or neutrino experiments. Um, that would maybe be able to give hints of this. So, do, do they look identical um, via purely gravitational suits, so just like microlensing? But the if you if you found some way of getting the microlensing constraints down further in mass, would they would they look different? Um, as far as I'm aware, I haven't looked too much into the microlensing, so I don't want to give like a concrete answer. But my understanding is that that relies on physics that would be beyond the size of the dimensions so those constraints wouldn't be yeah. changed at all so a purely gravitational experiments like that i don't think would be able to but i'm not a hundred percent positive there so i'm gonna leave a little wiggle room the other constraints well possible constraints in the area are what like the supernova ignition things and and that stuff, maybe that would be different with extra dimensions. I have no idea. I, they sort of showed that it doesn't ignite supernova, but maybe your ones do. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good question, because I know that there were a lot of constraints in this region that then now typically aren't shown. And I haven't yet gone through to all of them and then tried to figure out which ones apply. Like the we are still looking for like, hey, which other ways can we probe these? Like looking at like 21 centimeter impacts, trying to just like figure out all the different ways we can poke and probe these astrophysically because there are so many within this like regular 4D literature. Um, yeah, the supernova ones are ones that I, I should look at. That's a good point. The other thing I'm I'm still curious about is this uh, predicted abundance. Like, could you just explain in like kind of more detail exactly how you predict that? Because I don't know if I've ever seen like these kind of delta function predictions before for these black holes. Yeah. So the the reason it's really a delta function because so this production mechanism is very different than like the typical you have a large anisotropies and then they collapse, uh, like large perturbations that collapse. Yeah. And the reason, th so this is kind of the plot that um, shows things. So the way you have it is 
the abundance you get is dependent on, I guess, three properties. Your number of extra dimensions, your scale of quantum gravity, and what your reheating temperature is. So essentially the way you get this is you start your universe off at some reheating temperature, which has to be below the scale of quantum gravity. So you don't just completely overproduce these. And then as the universe cools, you're kind of cooling through um, this range of temperatures, uh, looking at this part, going from like right to left. And as you scan through these, producing slightly different mass black holes at each temperature, the mass doesn't change a lot over different temperatures. And there's a relatively small temperature window where you're producing the black holes, which means like we were finding that you get a range of masses, but it's a factor of like two in mass range. It, it, this, this sort of um, way that you can treat it as a delta function pretty um, well. Um, that Those black lines I was showing in the plot, I should note, isn't a delta, like that's not, I'm not showing the delta function there. It does, it's a line with a slight slant. That is, if you pick different reheating temperatures, you're going to get different abundances. So what that black line sh is showing is the mass and abundance for different reheating temperatures. And that gives a very steep, but not exactly vertical line in those constraints. Right. So this is some kind of reheating production mechanism for these black holes. It's different than usual. Yeah. So if after reheating, you we have some agnostic, you reheat to say like a tenth of your scale of quantum gravity. And then after that, the energetic particles, like the high velocity end of your Boltzmann distribution, will be colliding with energies above your quantum gravity scale. And those will create microscopic black holes that then grow through accretion, which, is, yeah, so it's very different than the typical scenario. That's kind of interesting because I, I feel like often the conventional wisdom is that like, especially for small black holes and in radiation domination, you don't expect any growth by accretion. So I'd be interested in, in looking at this more, to be honest. Yeah, that was definitely like an interesting thing. And one of like the interesting weird bits is this little vertical bit in the n equals two line. And what that bit is, is that these black holes would form, they would then grow to the point that they would then act like four dimensional black holes. And then because of that, the temperature would suddenly massively drop or no, the, the, there would be some sudden change or, or like quick change in temperature that then would allow them to just continue accreting. And you don't usually expect these four dimensional black holes to accrete, but it, it, yeah, it, it was very interesting like looking at like, oh, the accretion behavior is very different because of the different Hawking temperature um, and different properties, yeah. Right, that's yeah. a, super interesting. Any any final questions to wrap it up? Um, if not, that we'll thank uh, Avi for his time again. That was that was super interesting to me, at least. I I suspect it was to everybody else also. Uh, thanks for coming and telling us about your interesting paper. Yeah, we can do the the virtual clapping is always kind of awkward in Zoom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> clapping emojis all around. Um, thanks so much for having up. me. Of course. See you on uh, next Dark Chatter, episode 11. <laughs>